Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning here at our First Assembly of God uh, church service, digital church service we're having. And uh, if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles with me, we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter number 6. And I uh, do want to say thank you for tuning in with us. If you're watching this uh, on Facebook or on our, uh, on our, our website, I um, want to invite you to be a part if you're living here in the Mountain View area. Don't forget to join us on Monday nights at 7 o'clock for our mobile um, prayer meeting that we have going around our, our community. We start here at the church at 7 o'clock and then we go from the church to the hospital, down to the courthouse square, and then down to the sheriff's department and uh, praying over the different areas of our community. And uh, we did it as a live stream last week. And uh, for those that can't get out, we may do it again as a live stream. And uh, looking forward to the day when we can all be back together right here at, at, uh, at our dome and uh, can have church service again. So I want to encourage you to, to be with us. I want to say thank you for your faithfulness and giving as well. Uh, get Dropping off your, your tithes and offerings and your Elevate, uh, giving it uh, here in the uh, at the church or, or mailing it to our post office box or those of you that are giving online uh, as well through our tithely app process. So thank you so much for your giving. It is making a difference and uh, I want to I want to uh, just praise you for your generosity and uh, it is touching lives right here in our community and helping us to get work done here at our church because we're hoping when we all come back together we've got walls painted, we've got more concrete poured. We've got different things that are taking place while we're waiting. So uh, thank you for helping us. This this morning's message is entitled Bobby the Wonder Dog. And uh, this is a unique story that I want to share with you. And it's all about how the Holy Spirit leads us. And uh, this is a fascinating story because it, as we're going to find out through 1 Samuel chapter 6, God has a way of making things happen. It's not so much what I create, but what he does, and he does it through the Holy Spirit. As we are learning this year more and more about who the Holy Spirit is, how he operates, and, and uh, so I uh, want to dive right into this. Let's go back a few years to the year 1923. In uh, August of 1923, there was a couple by the name of Frank and Elizabeth Brazier, and they, they had some daughters, uh, Leona and Nova, and they were visiting friends in a town called Walcott, Indiana. And it was a 2,500 mile trip from Silverton, Oregon over to Walcott, Indiana. Now, in this story, uh, when they left the Northwest and, and were headed to, out to America's heartland, that uh, uh, they also brought along their family pet, and their pet's name was Bobby. Bobby was a two-year-old Scottish Collie English Shepherd mix. And uh, family pet went with them on the trip. And uh, you can imagine back in the early 20s, that was not a fast going car. And uh, roads weren't that great. Probably took quite a while. And at some point during their time while they were in Indiana with family, their dog Bobby happened to be attacked by uh, three other neighborhood dogs and ran off. Uh, Bobby took off. And after an exhaustive search, the, uh, the heartbroken Brazier family finally realized we, we don't know where Bobby is. We've called him. He hasn't come back. And uh, they're unable to find him. And they had to head home. They couldn't stay there. They had to go back to Oregon. And uh, so they wound up going back to Oregon without their dog. And, and you know, hey, that's in, that's in uh, uh, Indiana. Here we are in Oregon. We're never going to see that dog again. So forget it. And uh, so they went home. In February of 1924, six months later, uh, Bobby showed up in Silverton at their home uh, there in Oregon. He was dirty. He was mangy. He was scrawny, hadn't eaten well, and his, his, his nails were worn off to the pads, almost down to nothing. And uh, he showed all the signs of having covered the entire distance by foot, including, which would have in included, swimming some rivers and crossing the Continental Divide in the middle and the dead of winter. 
Think about that because you're talking uh, uh, August, September, all the way over to February, the coldest times there in Oregon. And think about everything, a 2,500 mile hike that dog would have had to have taken. And uh, during his ordeal, it's, it's uh, I believe they counted it up. It's 2,551 miles uh, between the two towns. And, uh, and there's plains, there's desert, and there's mountains, mountains in the winter time just to return home. And that would have been about an average, and I'll consider this, that would have been about an average of 14 miles a day, every day that that dog traveled for six months. Incredible. And after his return to Silverton, uh, he had this, this meteor rise to fame. Uh, suddenly, Bobby, Bobby the Wonder Dog became famous, and his story drew national attention. Uh, he was featured in, a, in several newspapers and newspaper articles. Ripley's Believe It or Not had a segment just for Bobby. Books, film. Matter of fact, Bobby would play himself in a 1924 silent film called uh, The Call of the West and, and was receiving mail all over the world. Here's a dog uh, right, right towards the beginning of the Great Depression. Here's a dog that's known worldwide for simply making a six-month six, uh, hike back home. And uh, an interesting twist to the story was as they began to investigate and what all took place, uh, the family, when they left, when they left Indiana and headed back to Oregon, that uh, uh, they would stop every night at a service station and, and turn the car off, and they would sleep in a service station parking lot in in the in their car overnight. And reports started coming in that the dog had been sighted uh, in uh, throughout those states. Wherever they stopped, the dog showed up eventually at those parking spots. It was almost as if he was following them step for step uh, like he could smell them. I don't know. He could smell them the entire way and, and did that. Crazy to me how phenomena like that occurs. And, and that's not the only one. You, you hear all the time of a dog or a cat uh, making their way home. And what was it, Milo and Otis or, or, or uh, some other dog stories from back in the day of, of dogs that wound up going home, stuff like that. And, and, but you see it all the time in migrating birds and, and uh, uh, whales and, and uh, great white sharks out there in the Pacific Ocean. And, and there's all kinds of stories about animals acting as if a hand is leading them. Think about that. Like a, a, a hand is, is leading birds to go to this area, whales to go to this area, dogs to go to this area, and, and how they can come back home uh, uh, once they've been dropped off in, in a place. And, and maybe it is. Consider for a moment that maybe it is a hand of God that is active in these animals' lives because it's happened before. Just throwing, throwing this out there. What if God brought Bobby the Wonder Dog all the way home because God has guided animals before? Look with me at 1 Samuel chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Let's look at this story. The ark of the Lord remained in the Philistine territory seven months in all. Then the Philistines called in their priests and diviners and asked them, What should we do about the ark of the Lord? Tell us how to return it to its own country. Send the ark of, uh, of the God of Israel back with a gift. They were told, Send a guilt offering so the plague will stop. Then if you are healed, you will know that it was His hand that caused the plague. What sort of guilt offering should we send, they asked. And they were told, Since the plague has struck both you and your five rulers make five gold tumors and five gold rats, just like those that have ravaged your land. Make these things to show honor to the God of Israel. Perhaps then He will stop afflicting you, your gods, and your land. Don't be stubborn and rebellious as Pharaoh and the Egyptians were. By the time God was finished with them, they were eager to let Israel go. Now, build a new ark and find two cows. Now, pay attention to this. 
find two cows who have just given birth to calves and make sure the cows have never been yoked to an ox, uh, to a cart uh, hitch the cows to the cart and shut their calves away from them in a pen but put the ark of the Lord on the cart and beside it place a chest containing the gold rats and the gold tumors you're sending as a guilt offering then let the cows go wherever they want verse 9 if they cross the border of our land and go to Beth Shemesh we will know it that it was the Lord who brought this great disaster upon us if they don't we will know it was not his hand that caused the plague it was simply by chance so these instructions were carried out. Two cows were hitched to the cart. Their newborn calves were shut in a pen. Then the ark of the Lord and the chest containing the gold rats and the gold tumors were placed in the cart. And sure enough, without veering off in other directions, the cows went straight along the road towards Beth Shemesh, lowing as they went. The Philistine rulers followed them as far as the borders of Beth Shemesh. The people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting wheat in the valley, and when they saw the ark, they were overjoyed. The, the cart came into the field of a man named Joshua and stopped beside a large rock. So the people broke, uh, broke up the wood of the cart for a fire. They killed the cows and sacrificed them to the Lord as a burnt offering. Several men of the tribe of Levi lifted the ark of the Lord and the chest containing the gold rats and the gold tumors from the cart and placed them on a large rock. Many sacrifices and burnt offerings were offered to the Lord that day by the people of Beth Shemesh. The five Philistine rulers watched all this and then returned to Ekron that same day. Now this is an interesting story. There's a, there's a lot of, of little bits and pieces here, and I want to try to cover this as, as quickly as I can. But uh, if you had read the prior chapter uh, of this, you would find that uh, the, the Philistines had the Ark of the Covenant because they had defeated Israel in a battle, and they stole the Ark. They took it and took it back with them uh, into their nation. And because they had the Ark, an un, unclean, unsaved nation, Nation, had the Ark of the Covenant, did not belong to them. God brought judgment upon, upon that nation with a plague of rats and an outbreak of tumors. Uh, and as a penance offering to God, the Philistines made golden images of these things. Now this is interesting. Five rats, because there was, there was the five major cities uh, uh, in in the land of the Philistines, there's five major cities there that, that were troubled with these plagues. And so you had five rats, but the five tumors. And what's interesting, and I'm not going to stay here a whole lot, and, and but and, and, and if, if you haven't heard this before, you could say you heard it right here first, okay? So the Hebrew of that in the Old Testament, when you translate that into the Greek, that word tumors literally translates to tumors in the groin. Tumors in the groin. Uh, some Bible scholars have actually said that this is this is wording for hemorrhoids. Um, what a tumor in the groin is, I don't know. Uh, we know what hemorrhoids are. How do you make a golden cast of a hemorrhoid? We're not going to stay here and speculate on this. We're just going to say there was five golden tumors in there and just leave it at that. Now, here's what I want you to think about. And this is key for this whole story. This is a key thought. Is that there are many interesting features to the whole of this particular story uh, which shows the intricate pattern of how the Holy Spirit it works without the aid of people. The Holy Spirit works on His own without having to have us. God is fully capable of doing. Now, listen, God looks for people to work through. He needs hands to work through. But there are some things where the Holy Spirit will do it by Himself because there's nobody else doing it. Okay? So here's the first point of this story. The Holy Spirit made the Philistines as glad to part with the ark as they were to take it. Here it is, a gold box. It's a national treasure. They know Israel is gone to pieces without it and it's a rich thing and so they're literally holding this box hostage because they know Israel will pay a, a, a big price for it. So it's a ransom demand is what it is. They've got it and they're waiting for Israel to pay out the nose for it. And uh, But by the end of it, God did such a thing that not... Uh, 
the rats and, and all these nether reflections uh, uh, outweighed the trophy of the conquest. However great this trophy was, we've got Israel's Ark of the Covenant. Man, they're ready to get rid of this thing after all of these plagues have come upon them. Not to mention how the Holy Spirit, and this is interesting, go back and read that story, where they put it in the temple of their god Dagon, and when they went in there one time, they found him down on his face, which is a, uh, a symbol of, of obeisance. I'm, I'm, I'm paying homage to that which is greater than I am. But then they set the statue back up and came back later and found not only was the statue back on his face, but I believe it says his, his head and his hands were cut off. And, and this, was, this was very much a humiliation. This was God saying, I am greater in, in a context that would have meant something to that nation. God is saying, I am greater than your God Dagon. God's speaking to them in a language that they could easily understand. Now, even without receiving an, a, a ransom from Israel as they hoped to do, the enemy of Israel not only returned the ark for free, but they added treasure to it as an apology. Now think about that. Suddenly you have an enemy that's coming to you, and they're paying you uh, tribute, saying, forget it, we don't want a ransom, we're going to give you some cash, we're gonna, we're, and, and we're sorry for what we did. Think about that. God orchestrated that. There's no way man could have. God did all that. And, and, and here's what I think. When I, because I, I like to be sort of a, a, a critical person. I like to ask the questions. And so I read this story and I ask the question, where was the rescue team? You know, Israel lost this thing, and it's their greatest treasure. Where's the rescue team that's going over there to rescue that? Where's the, where's the, the, the SEAL team? Where's the recon spies that are going in there? Say, we want our ark back. And, and they're spying out the land to find out where the ark is, how it's situated, and how they can go in there and get it. And what's interesting is nobody was. We don't have, in, in, I don't know, but we don't have any biblical evidence whatsoever that says Israel was looking for the Ark of the Covenant, that they were desperate to get the Ark of the Covenant home. God literally had to deliver the Ark of the Covenant Himself. God did it Himself. Uh, Matthew Henry, the commentator Matthew Henry, mentions in his commentations on this story, he says, God will be no loser in His glory at last by the successes of the church's enemies against His ark, but He will get honor Himself, or He will get Himself honor from those that seek to dishonor Him, or to do dishonor to Him. God says, I'm going to take care of this myself. This is Matthew Henry's comment, comment, uh, comments on this. And, that they, and, and what's interesting is not only does he bring honor to himself, he causes, he causes his enemy to dishonor themselves. Go back and look at the story. Who was it that followed the ark and watched it get set back up in Israel. It says it was the rulers of the cities. Rulers don't do that. Rulers don't follow. Rulers don't watch. They send their servants to go do it. But it says at this point, they're not sending their servants to do it. The rulers themselves are acting like servants to see what happens. Interesting. This was a very humbling thing. God was humbling the Philistine leaders in the midst of all this while He's bringing Himself glory. Now the second thing is, is that the Holy Spirit brought His own revival to His people. Now watch this. The men of Beth Shemesh were busy during the wheat harvest and they were working the land. At this time when, when all this was taking place, the wheat harvest was there, and you see them, they're out there cutting all the wheat and they're bringing it all together. They're getting all the harvest done. They're busy in the fields. They were busy doing their secular business. However, they were not thinking about the ark nor making any inquiries about it. And, and, and on the one hand, that's not good. They were... Uh, they there should have been some outcry, especially Beth Shemesh was, I guess, one of the closest areas 
to where the Ark of the Covenant was. And they weren't looking for it. Instead, they were, they were busy doing their secular business. The Bible says in Haggai chapter 1, verse 9, it says, My house lies in ruins, says the, heaven, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, while all of you are busy building your own fine houses. And so in his own time, God will bring deliverance to his church. And not only as it is being fought against by her enemies, but even as it's being neglected by her friends. I want you to consider this thought. Think about this for a moment. That when God's people are in trouble in his own time, God will bring deliverance to his church. Not only as it's being fought against by her enemies, but even as it's being neglected by her friends. Now, some scholars believe at the least that this is tidings, them, them being out there working the fields and doing the grain and all this. There are some scholars that look on the positive side. The bad news is you're not looking for the ark. Well, what's the good news of it? They're busy uh, um, uh, being faithful to their employed duties of working the field instead of being lazy and unproductive. Instead of being a society that's not doing anything and just woe is us, instead they are busy. Busy, they are productive. They are doing something. It may not be by you know getting the ark back, but at least they're busy bringing in the flock. Similarly, think about this: the tidings of Christ's birth were brought to the shepherds as they were keeping watch over their flocks by night. Think about that. They weren't looking for the coming of Christ, which all of Israel should have been doing at that time. They should have been looking for, for Jesus' coming, but they weren't. And guess what? The angels didn't show up to the lazy, to those that were doing nothing. The angels showed up to those that were busy doing the work. They were at least busy doing the work and they revealed themselves. Matthew Henry, again in his commentary, says this, The devil visits idle men with his temptations, but God visits industrious men with his favors. The devil visits idle men with his temptations, but God visits industrious men with his favors. And when the working men looked up, and think about this for a second, they looked up and they saw the ark. Imagine their surprise. They're busy just working the field, and suddenly there's some cows with nobody leading them with a cart, and there on the back of the cart is the ark of the covenant. They're su surprised when they discern exactly what it is they're looking at, and suddenly unbridled joy begins to just pour out of them, this mix of shock and joy. There's the ark of the covenant they recognized they knew exactly what it was and suddenly righteous pandemonium broke out psalms 126 verses 1 and 2 says it was like a dream we were filled with laughter and we sang for joy even though they may not have had the courage or the zeal to go after the ark, they nevertheless had a whole lot of excitement to give it a proper welcome with worship and even a sacrifice. They, they knew to do these things. Now, let's go to this third thing. The Holy Spirit caused cows that had never left Ekron to know the way to bring the ark home. Again, here's how, the, here's how the Holy Spirit is making things happen. You, 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 we see how the Holy Spirit made the Philistines glad to get rid of their, their best, best captured treasure. Uh, the Holy Spirit brought revival to His own people. He's the one that got them excited. It wasn't anything they did. It's what the Holy Spirit did that got them excited about God. And then the Holy Spirit caused these cows to, to bring the ark home. Now, ancient Ekron is believed to be about 20 miles west of Jerusalem, halfway between Jerusalem and the Mediterranean Sea. Now, there's nothing there today but a, what they call a tell. It's a hill uh, in the middle of a field. Ekron was about 10 to, a 10 to 12 mile journey from Beth Shemesh. So it wasn't all that far. But still, 10 to 12 miles, that's a long way for an unguided cow to get out on the road and, and, uh, 
and to make it. Now consider all the hurdles that the Philistines made this sign have to clear. They said, you know what? Perhaps their God is doing this. And if their God is doing this, then we're going to put all these hurdles in the way to make the God of Israel prove himself uh, uh, that he was behind the scene of it all. The cows, first of all, had never been yoked before. If you've never rode a horse that's never been saddle broke, you're in for a horrible ride. That, that, that horse is not going to take to the saddle instantly. Neither will a cow who has never worn a yoke pull a cart. That cow is going to hop, skip, jump, and, and raise an almighty fit. It's not going to walk peacefully. Secondly, uh, they had calves that they had never left before. If you've ever, and I grew up on a farm, we had cows and calves, and if you ever got between a mama cow and her calf, you're in trouble. There was times we would have to pull the calves away from their mamas so that we could tag them, uh, uh, we could doctor them, do little things uh, to them, cut the horns off, stuff like that. And there was things we had to do. So we pull the calves away from their mamas. Those mamas did not leave. Those mamas stayed right there. And you could hear them mooing and fussing all the way up at the house, which was uh, uh, like about a quarter mile away. You could hear the cows bellowing uh, because their calves were separated from them. This is what's going on. So you had to have a cow that's never been put in a yoke. That's disaster. Take their calves away from them. That's a disaster. And then they had, these cows had never been away from their own fields in this place. They've never been to Israel, much less past that little uh, piece of land right over there. They've never been past that field over there. And so here you got these cows that have got to do this. And yet, the Bible story, what we have is they drew that wagon evenly, orderly, Always moving forward. The Bible says they didn't go to the left. They didn't go to the right. Doesn't even say that they, they got off the road to graze for a little bit. There was no driver. They were away from the barns. They were away from their babies. They had no hay. And they never turned away. Uh, it says to either eat nor rest, but only to come straight to Beth Shemesh, which was a priestly city. Now think about this. Think about this. Here's a whole nother wrinkle to this story. Beth Shemesh is a city of priests that dated back to the days of Moses' brother Aaron, smack dab in the middle of Judah, the land, uh, and it was the land of the temple priests. So, so literally the cow brought the Ark of the Covenant to a field full of priests that knew what to do with it next. Those cows could have gone anywhere and even had they crossed the land into Israel, they could have gone to any, any valley, any city, any place. But instead, they came to the one city, to the one set of fields and stopped. They stopped in the middle of a field that was full of priests that knew knew that ark and they knew how to take care of that ark. If anybody in Israel had an appreciation for the ark of the covenant, it was the men that were tilling the fields that day uh, uh, when the cows showed up. Think about this. Think about how powerful that story is with all these things that had to take place, had to go forward, and God made sure that that ark went to the, the only people in the entire nation who had the greatest appreciation and knowledge of what to do with that ark. And the Holy Spirit led these dumb animals, led them against all odds to the right place and to the right people. And then get this, into the field. Now, and I don't think the Bible does this on accident. Who owned the field? It said that they were in the field of Joshua, which comes from the name Yeshua or what? Jesus. Joshua is the form of the name that we use of as Jesus. And so it happened in May at the time of Pentecost. Uh, it was a picture of the workers in the field gathering, but without the spirit that was now a about to come on them to where? A place that had a solitary rock in the middle of a cleared field. If you understand farmland, you get all the rocks out of the farmland and, and it just so happens that in this one field, and it describes it by name, who belonged to Jesus and it, Joseph, who belonged to uh, the name that we get the name Jesus from, and there's one large rock they can't get out of there. It's a rock that they literally 
usually have to sow all the way around. They have to work all the way around. And, uh, and that rock is in the middle of the field and cannot tell you what that rock is. Right there on the middle of the field where they made the sacrifice and they had a revival breakout on that rock. That rock is Psalms 18 verse 2. It is that the Lord is my rock. He is my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock. It's 1 Samuel 2, 2 says, There is no rock like our God. Genesis 49 verse 24. The mighty one of Jacob by the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. He is the rock and his deeds are perfect. Psalms 18, 31 and 46 says this. For who is God except the Lord? Who but our God is a solid rock. The Lord lives. Praise to my rock. May the God of my salvation be exalted. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. Paul says, all of them drank the same spiritual water for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them and that rock was Christ. Psalms 118 verse 22 the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Isaiah 28 verse 16 therefore this is what the sovereign Lord says look I'm placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem a firm and tested stone it is a precious cornerstone and it is safe to build on whoever believes need never be be shaken. That rock in that stone is literally the Lord Jesus in his own field. The presence of God came in that day. Now look at this. Think about the triumphal entry. Think about Jesus Christ come riding in on a donkey and suddenly the people see him as he comes in. And it says that the people as they saw Jesus coming in on this animal said they began waving the palm branches and they got excited and they ushered Jesus in right into Jerusalem, the very city of the king. Think about it. This is a precursor of it. Here is the presence of God made manifest in the Ark of the Covenant, brought in by the cows to the field of Jesus and set upon a rock and everybody started praising God and worshiping God. The fact that these very priests weren't looking for the Ark, but they recognized it when they saw it, was unfortunately not what happened when Jesus came in that day. That is, Jesus came in, the priest that should have been looking for the Messiah missed him. And what a great thing could have happened. As we saw in that story, what a great thing could have happened. But unfortunately it didn't. Let me, let's transition here for a second. Have you felt that you don't know the path that lies ahead of you, in front of you. Not just the days of the coronavirus we're in, but what about after the coronavirus? Was your life already roadless? Was it already difficult before this hit and now it just seems worse? Does it seem like you would say, I don't know my purpose. I don't know what God has for me. I, I, don't, know, I don't know where I'm headed. I, I don't know. I just don't know. You question whether God can or will be able to help you. That happens even among the best of us. Pastors go through that. If pastors go through that, you'll go through that at some point. Well, you're not sure. I know God can do anything, but will God do anything for me? Does God even care? Do you feel like God is powerless to overcome your problems? Has darkness, I guess, kind of drowned out the light in your life? I want you to take heart today. God sees you. God cares about you. God loves you. God is crazy about you. While you're sleeping tonight, God's going to be up all night long getting Monday ready for you, getting your next day ready for you, and He does it on a daily basis. He knows who you are. He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows. This is your day of freedom. To understand this, God, God created His own revival. God created His own deliverance. God created His own uh, uh, redemption of, of the priests, calling them back to righteousness. God can, God does, and God will. Even for you. 
even for you, the Holy Spirit still leads and accomplishes what we as mere people can't do for ourselves. We can't do it. And that's kind of the whole point of, of it. It's not about us doing it. It's about Him doing it for us. When you understand what legalism is, legalism is whatever I can do to make myself righteous with God. Whatever I can do. So if I've got to cut my hair a certain way, if I've got to uh, talk a certain way, if I've got to walk a certain way, if I've got to dress a certain way, just so I can be right with God, that says I'm righteous because of what I do. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says no one is righteous, no, not one. And that even our righteousness is as filthy rags. We are righteous because Christ makes us righteous. We are saved because He makes us saved. We, we are strong because He is our strength. We are wise because He gives us wisdom. We have because He provides. So I want us to pray today, and I want to pray for you specifically today. I want to pray for you to understand God sees you God knows where you're at. He knows what you're going through. It's not a matter of, is God capable? God's capable. The question is, is are we capable to believe in Him? You see, the greatest attribute that the child of God has in this walk is our faith. That's all. It's our faith, believing in the God that we cannot see to orchestrate the steps that we have not taken that will lead to a place that we've never been. We believe in faith that God is going to take care of us. And see, the thing about faith is faith doesn't make things easy. It just makes them possible. Faith is believing in what we cannot see that something is going to happen. And we practice faith every day. Every time you put your 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 key in the ignition, you, you flip up the light switch. Any anytime you step out to try something and it works, it, there's an element of faith in there, pulling the starter on your lawnmower. Well it's the same thing with God. We take a moment and say, God, I I need your help. And the greatest admission that you could make is not to lie and say, I've got faith when you don't. No, it's that father of the demon-possessed boy that Jesus encountered. When he said, Lord, if you can do anything, heal my son. And Jesus said, do you believe I can do it? And the man replied, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. Help my unbelief. God can cause a dog to come home from 2,500 miles away. God can cause a cow, two cows, to travel 10 to 12 miles in a straight line to a field full of priests. God knows where you are. And God can take care of you. You have to surrender whatever it is your life is encountering right now to Him. And just to be able to say, Lord, I trust you. And I believe you're going to help me through this. Because again, the greatest ingredient we have in this life is our faith. It's the one thing that we can bring to the table. And the only reason we have faith is because God helps us with our faith. So literally, when Jesus says you've got to become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven, Daddy, I can't do anything. I need your help. That's a good place to start right there. Bow your head with me. That Lord, right now in this place, we confess our inability. We confess our ignorance. We confess... Lord God, that our lack of direction, our lack of purpose, our lack of sense, our, our, our lack, Lord God, we just confess our lack. And Father, right now I pray, let your spirit be in the very room where people are watching this. And Father, I pray right now that you begin speaking to their heart and their mind just how big you are, how strong you are, how mighty you are, how patient you are. Let them know right now they are loved, they are remembered and not forgotten. 
You've got them, Lord. And you'll never let them go. And that, Father, if, if you fail any one of us, we'll be the first people in history that you've ever failed. Your track record is a whole lot better than us. It's a whole lot better than the other people in our lives. So help us, Lord God, to run this right. And Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would help us to trust you. Help us to trust you. And right now, where you're at, and you're watching this with your head bowed, eyes closed, just a little personal time between you and Jesus. Whatever it is that you're dealing with right now, would you confess that to Him? Whatever your frustrations are, whatever your fears are, whatever your uncertainties are, right now where you're at, would you just take a moment and say, God, this is what I'm dealing with. Confess it to Him. Just confess it to Him. Tell Him what it is you're dealing with. Tell Him your pain. Tell Him your, your anxiousness. And then reveal to Him your willingness to wait. Lord, I pray right now that as we confess these things to You, as we give these things to You, that Father God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, that Lord, You help us to be patient, help us to be willing, Lord God, to let You speak. And Father, I pray right now that the very presence of God be so real, be so real and powerful in the room that, Father, there's no doubt in the world about it. They got excited when Jesus came in. They got excited when the, when the cows brought the ark in. Lord God, let us be excited because your presence right now is in the room. And while we may not see the answers to our dilemmas yet, we can know that the answer provider is in the room with us. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's how I want to close this today. Before you turn this off and before you go eat lunch or, or do whatever you do, would you just take a quiet moment and turn everything off, maybe get away from the people that are around you? Would you take some quiet time and get with God and say, Lord, I need this help. I want to ask you in that quiet time to be still and listen for the voice of God. John chapter 10, my sheep know my voice. Take a moment and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let the Holy Spirit be real to you. Let the Holy Spirit comfort you in that moment and help you to know, know He's there. Know He's got you. Know it's all going to be okay. Guys, I love you. Thank you for tuning in with us today for our service here at the Dome Church. I pray God ministers to you, those that can come out tomorrow night, come out and be in our mobile prayer meeting. Stay tuned to our website and our our uh, Facebook page for all the th different things that we've got going on. I love you. Be sure and hit like and make some comments. Listen, if you've, if you've got questions or something, make comments below or contact me. Contact me at my email, mike at mv1ag.com. Email me and, uh, and let's, let's start some, some dialogue about how God wants to move in your life and, and bring victory into your life now. And even in the midst of trial, it's still the best life you've ever had. I love you. God bless you. You guys have a great, great rest of your day.